but I've given it all up. I count it as loss. I count it as waste in my life compared to now knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Knowing is an intimate word that speaks of communion and an intimacy, a relationship, just like a husband and wife, a personal intimate relationship. He's saying, I give it all up that I might know him intimately in, 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 a, in a very powerful way. Then in verse 10, right, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attend to the resurrection from the dead. What he's saying here is that I might find myself positioned in him, no longer in me, but now in Christ by faith, which would be walking out my life before God in the promises that God has given me, which is faith in his son. Why? That I might have an intimate personal communion with him in the great the abundance of his greatness and resurrection, having the sweetness of fellowship with him in the suffering that I'm facing for him, making me like him in his death. What he's talking about is resembling him in his death. You understand what that means? It means, number one, something Paul, when he was Saul, you would never find in his life. What might you think it'd be? Sin? No. Humility? No, yeah, I would never be there. Absolutely. Big time. So what he's saying here is learning that resembling Christ in his death is the greater walk of a believer in Christ. Number one would be forgiving those who do me wrong. You'd never find Saul forgiving anyone that did him wrong. You would find him directly right out there in someone's face to bark them down. I'm making my stand. This is where I stand. Who are you to bring something against me? Who do you think you are? That all that means this is how great I think I am. So, so in resembling him in his death would be number one, forgiving those who do me wrong. That's for the rest of his life. Number two, it would be showing mercy towards those who would come against me. You'd never find Saul showing mercy to anyone who came against him. But now, because of Christ, he realizes everything that I was my whole life, I consider loss. Now knowing Christ my Lord, being conformed into his death, learning that forgiving those who do me wrong is greater than stepping over them so I could have my way. Learning that showing mercy towards those who would come against me is greater than me having to have my way. And number three, freely pouring grace upon all who cross my path, something Saul would never have done, to freely give that person the grace, the same grace God pours upon my life every second of my life. You know how great the grace that God pours upon our life is? It's more than we can comprehend. That's the truth. You know how much he's forgiven me? Well, you know how much he's forgiven you. And when he says, I remember your sins no more, guess what? He, guess what? he remembers them no more. That's hard for me to comprehend. And then and to live my life out treating others the same way he treats me, something Saul would have never done. But he says, this is, this is where he's taken me. And this didn't happen overnight. This has taken so far about 30 years of his life to learn to walk this way. Which brings us then to verse 12. He says, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. You know, I look at Paul's life and, and when he was Saul and now that he's Paul and everything he just said in verses 1 through 11, you're like, wow, what an abundant Christian life to be able to forgive quick as a hat and never bring it up again, to be able to show unconditional mercy and grace to all who do me wrong or come into my life. And Paul says, not that I have already obtained it. You're like, What? You mean, what is that supposed to mean? Not that I have already obtained it. The word obtained means received. It speaks of what he will have in heaven. 
So what Paul is saying here is right now, because of my salvation in Christ, right now I have been given, number one, God's grace. Number two, the gift of Christ's righteousness. Number three, the forgiveness of my sins. Number four, the adoption as a child of God. Number five, the incorruptible inheritance in Christ waiting for me in heaven. This is what I have right now. Paul's saying, I haven't obtained it yet, but he's given it to me. It is right here. It is mine, but I haven't obtained it yet. And he says, or have already become perfect. And the word perfect here speaks of a young man growing up into a mature man. So Paul's saying, right now, because of the, the salvation I have in Christ, I am maturing. Yeah, can you say that today? I know people in my Christian life that cannot say they can mature, they're maturing because they can't mature. I'm not growing in him. I, uh, that's what he's saying here. He's saying, literally, in the eyes of God, I am perfect in uprightness and integrity. In the eyes of God, I am perfect in the truth of grace that's in me. Paul's faith was unfinged. It means it wasn't counterfeit. His love was without dissimulation, which means there was nothing hidden behind it. Um, his hope was without hypocrisy in the sight of God, not in the sight of Paul. Paul looked at his faith and he said, man, I need to mature in this. God's saying, you're perfect as far as I'm concerned. Paul looked at his hope. He's saying, man, I, I, I need a hope that has no hypocrisy in it. I look at my life and I'm, I'm the worst person I know. I hate what I see deep inside the core of my being. And Paul's saying, but that's not how God sees me. This is what's happening. Paul's saying, I have been given the grace of God, the righteousness of Christ, the forgiveness of my sins, the adoption as a child of God, an incorruptible inheritance in Christ waiting for me, and I am maturing in it. I am learning step by step day by day, how to walk out my faith in Christ. And you know what I've come to realize, Paul's saying, after 30 years, God's not worried about my growth because I'll never fully get it until I'm with him. You know what we retain for the rest of our life once you become a Christian? You, your humanity. Everybody understand that? I have the spirit walk, and I'm going to walk in the spirit, brother, and be perfect until I, someone steps in my toe or says something I don't like. Or man wants to talk to me. I'll talk to you privately, brother. You've got something. Where's my flesh? It's coming up. Because I retain my humanity for the rest of my being. And I learn, I mature to walk in the love of God. You know how God teaches you to mature in his love, in his grace, in his mercy? It's all done within the fellowship of believers. It's not done when you are alone in your home and reading your Bible. That's part of it, but then you get within the fellowship of God's believers and someone crosses you the wrong way. And God's saying, you know how much I forgive you? Yes, I know. Well, forgive them right now. Well, you don't know how hard it is. You don't know the pressures they put on me. You don't understand what they're asking me to do. You know how much mercy I show you every day? Oh, yes, Lord, I do. Show them that mercy. Lord, really? Really? You know how much grace and love I pour upon you? Show it to them. That's what he's trying to show them here. So Paul is speaking a powerful truth. He's saying, I have all these things because of my faith in Christ, yet I'm still in my humanity. Means my human nature wars against these things, so I feel like I don't really have them. I've been given them, and at the same time, I'm maturing in them. So he says, I lay hold of uh, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what what lies ahead. So when he says, I lay hold of it, means I run unto it like I really own it. So I run to it. All right, you've given me this life in Christ, and I, 
I hate what I see in my life. So I've learned now to run to what you've given me. Instead of running back to me, which is always a mess, I've learned to run to you, to lay hold of it. What he's saying is, I run towards that which Jesus Christ died to give me. I run towards salvation. I run towards sanctification. And I leave behind all that hinders my race. That's what he's saying. In verse 13, again, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, I reach forward to what lies ahead. I no longer estimate any value of an inventory of myself, of all that I've accomplished. Um, I drop from my own opinion what is put away from my past, and I stretch past myself. I leave my feelings and emotions behind and I run towards what God has placed before me. What Paul is saying is, I got feelings, I got emotions, and they're no different than all of yours. But I'm leaving them behind, I count them as loss, and I press on towards all that Christ has for me. I run towards salvation. I run towards sanctification. I run towards Jesus Christ. And I leave me behind. You know, Paul lived his life like that. And I'm very thankful because when you read his books and the New Testament books that he wrote, he talks about himself being the chief of sinners. And in Romans, he's saying, you know, I am what I am, but that's all that I am. I, 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 it's me, and I hate me. And, and so I, I say, okay, the good I want to do, I don't do, and the bad I don't want to do, I do. And he's like, I'm just, I'm tired of me. Let me ask you this. Do you ever get tired of you? Are you at that place in your life? There's, there's nothing wrong with that in your Christian life. You should be able to look at the mirror and go, man, I am so sick of you. Why don't you take a walk up a long pier somewhere and leave the inner me, Christ part of me, and, I'll, and I can deal with stuff for the rest, and God's going, it's you. It's me in you that's perfect, and it's not you that's perfect. It's me in you. Don't ever forget that. Because I got to deal with my humanity for the rest of my life on this earth. And if your eyes are fixed on my humanity, both you and I will stumble all day. But you fix your eyes on Jesus Christ and you know exactly what I know. None of us are perfect in our flesh. But he is perfect who dwells within me. And mine is to run towards him, to lean on him, to wholly press on towards him. Look at verse 14. So I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. This is a powerful statement here that he makes. I press on. This speaks of enduring through great suffering. Really important. Because the suffering part doesn't mean persecution and it doesn't mean religious pressures. The suffering means learning to leave behind my past opinions and my past shames and my past regrets. And though the enemy reminds me of them daily, through my though my flesh reminds me of them daily, I endure through these great sufferings. I press on. That means for the rest of my life, the enemy is going to remind me what a wretched sinner I am. And the second I say the wrong thing or act the wrong way, it's easier to just to pack up and run for my life than to have stand here and have to face myself or face what someone's trying to say to me. How many times do you ever run away? Just pack up and go. I just can't take the pressure anymore. What do you want from me? Boom, I'm, I'm running out the door. And yet God's trying to soften your heart. God's, God's there saying, I'm, I'm trying to teach you to endure through these great sufferings. Because there are some things you have to wrestle down. There are some things in your Christian life he's not going to take away. And that's your humanity. And you have to wrestle it before God. And it's something that each and every person has to do. And he says, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upper call. So towards the goal. This term speaks of the white line at the end of the race, the finish line. It's as if Paul's saying, in my mind, I can see the finish line. 
and I'm pressing towards it with all that I have. It's like every day I wake up, there's the finish line. I press towards that, and I'm never going to give up. I'm going to press on, and if I wake up the next day, I'm looking towards that finish line, and I'm pressing on, you know, so his eyes aren't elsewhere. He's focused, and he's staying. He's pressing on. He says, towards the goal for the prize. The prize here literally means the incorruptible crown. Very important. I've talked to people about this incorruptible crown before, and in their great humility, they've said to me, no, 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 I don't wear a crown. That's for Jesus. I'm not going to put a crown on. And yet the incorruptible crown doesn't speak of a crown that you wear as a jewel, but it speaks boldly of the righteousness and glory of Christ Jesus our Lord that we will have in heaven. You have him now, all of him. And that crown of righteousness is, shines when you forgive. That crown of righteousness shines when you show mercy. That crown of righteousness shines when you hand out the same grace he gives you. And you say, I'm, it's not about me anymore. It is about you in me. And if you're going to live in me, then you desire to dwell through me. And this is how you dwell through me. The crown of righteousness, the incorruptible crown, shines. And what's that shine? Your grace, your mercy, your love freely poured out of me because you freely poured it into me. You know, I got saved in a Pentecostal church. You know what that means? For years, I was waiting for the Holy Spirit to do something in my life. When guess what I had the whole time? The Holy Spirit. The whole time. The whole time. I'm waiting, God, when are you going to finally move? And God kept saying, when are you going to finally get up off your duff and go do something? When are you going to forgive that person? Well, just as soon as you fill me with forgiveness. I already have. Oh, well, Lord, when are you going to do this? God's like, I've already done it. It is finished. When are you going to do it? When will you step into it? Maybe some of you are here today. You know, you know what? I'm just done with me. I'm done with me. That's what Paul's saying. I'm done with me. You shine through me. God's saying, I've been trying to for many years. But when will you forgive? When will you call a spade a spade and be honest and, and hand out mercy and show grace the same way I give it to you every day? And so Paul's saying, I, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God. That's the calling of God into his kingdom. Literally, that one day he will call me home, and on that day I will finish the race he's given me to run. Not until that day when he calls me home will I have crossed the finish line and left behind my flesh, and I will glory in his righteousness. But until he calls me home, I'm fixed on that finish line, seeking the prize that you would shine through me. My actions have a part of that, a responsibility to love, to forgive, to show mercy, and to show grace. And, and it's his love, his mercy, his grace. So, so Paul says, so I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus meaning literally whom God ordained before time began that through his hands alone can these eternal blessings be handed out to those who run this race, to those who will trust him. Do you want the blessings of God in your life? And the blessings are right here. Then there's a responsibility you and I have. And that's to press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. You've accomplished it, you've completed it, you've done it, and you've done it in me. And it's time that I get my eyes off me and I fix my eyes on this race that you've given me to run and I press on towards this goal because it's you that, that I want to be Lord of my life. It's you that I'm trusting. It's you that I lean upon with every ounce of my being. And God's saying, that's exactly what Paul's saying here in Philippians chapter 3. In verse 15, let us therefore, 
as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if anything, you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. Very important here. What he's saying, literally, um, let us therefore, okay, so suffer it to be so, strong words there, let us therefore suffer it to be so that all who are being matured in Christ, all that are being sanctified in Christ, have this attitude. Literally means counting the things that are gained for me in Christ and counting the things that I have accomplished in this life as loss. This is the attitude, forgetting the things behind and reaching towards the things ahead. Leaving behind the past, especially in your heart and mind, and pressing on towards the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And the attitude would be, don't live in fear of it, because if you try to keep this attitude in your heart and mind, God will be faithful to show you if you stray from it. You see what Paul's saying there? Don't be afraid. I can't run this race. You know how hard it is? And I know I can forgive some people, but there's some people I can't. And I can show mercy out, but man, you, you don't know the difficulty it is to do that sometimes. He's saying, don't be afraid of that. Because as you learn to mature in this race that you're running, God will, he's faithful to keep you on track in it, isn't he? I'll tell you, as a believer, I remember years ago as a believer, I remember thinking, forget it. I was trying to be filled with the Holy Spirit and the whole Pentecostal movement. And it's like nothing was, I'm like, forget it. Forget the battle. Forget this. I'm just going to go be a Christian and do as I please. I don't know. If God loves me, he's going to see me through. A big mistake that was. Because God never let me forget who I was in him. And what a miserable life I had. I can tell you that right now. Trying to, to live as I pleased in Jesus' name. Because I was done with trying to live this Christian life. And what I was trying to do is accomplish it in my own power. Not lean upon him and do as he says. He knows exactly what my life needs to be and where I need to go. So what Paul's saying is don't be afraid to walk this way. Because God is faithful to put you right back on track, right where you need to be. He's faithful to do it. Verse 16. However, let us keep living by the same standard to which we've attained. And all he's saying here is, you know, if you've been taught this way, then keep the same mind with those who are living according to the same standard. Literally, stay in fellowship with those that have the same attitude and the same mind as this. Don't pack up and move somewhere else and find something else to do. Stay within the, the fellowship of God's people with the same mind and attitudes there. You know, we had the men's breakfast. We had a great time there. We have the Wednesday night Bible study. We have the, the Tuesday evening men's study. We have the ladies' Bible study on Friday. And, and we come together so that with like-minded people. Now, we don't all see eye to eye in everything, but, but Christ is the same in our heart, and the Spirit of God is the same in our life. And we keep this mindset. We keep this heart set. And we walk united together with the children of God. And you know what we do? We grow. And that's part of maturing in Christ. In verse 17, brethren, he addresses them, brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. So what he's saying here is, it's, it's important to follow on after the same example that you've been given, even looking deeply for the scars of those who walk this way. Literally, leaving for us the same example to follow. Do you know that God's servants are scarred? I know many great religious people, and there's no scarring there whatsoever. But I know many servants of God, and they're scarred. You know what God's servants are scarred with? Grace. I've met so many people who told me they're a Christian and, and, and walked in arrogant pride and caused division in churches because their whole focal point is all about their own selfish heart. And you know what they're not scarred with? The grace of God. God's grace is not there because if His grace was there, what would be handed out by their life? 
As a servant of the Lord, you're scarred with the grace of God. You know what that means? You have no choice but to hand out His grace. Because that's what's filled you up, is the grace of God, the mercy of God. So Paul's saying, follow on after the same example, looking for those who have deep scars in the grace of God, who have the same mind, the same heart, and walk with them. And he says, because there's a great many who walk not in submission to Jesus Christ. And he's telling them, I've told you this with tears, and I weep for their souls. He says, they're enemies of the cross of Christ. Why? They've made themselves accusers of the brethren, and they use the grace of God for their own personal gain and glory. And he says, be careful, because they're out there, and they come in Jesus' name. You know, wolves dress in sheep's clothing as far as the body of Christ goes. And they love to come into the church. And when they come in, we take care of business. I'll tell you that right now. You know how you tell a wolf? We've walked through this before. A wolf looks just like a sheep, talks like a sheep, He's got a sheep skin on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> no, yeah, to, yeah, you walk up and poke them. Tell you what. You poke a lamb, you know what they do? They fall over. <laughs> Can't get up. Help me up. Yeah, come on, I'll help you up. You poke a wolf, what do you lose? You lose your, he'll turn around and rip your flesh off your hand. He'll turn around and bite you. Be careful. Because there's a lot of wolves out there. And Paul's saying, I'm not a wolf. Because I've poured, I've scarred with the grace of God. You want to know who the wolf was? The wolf was Saul. And God took a wolf and made him a lamb. And then took that lamb and said, go tell the other lambs how to walk with my son, how to trust in his spirit, how to live according to my word. Well, what about if, if this? He's, God's saying, poke them. You'll find out what they're all about. There's some out there that are the enemies of the cross. In verse uh, 19, he says, these enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. What a frightening thing to say. He says, um, whose end is destruction. That word destruction means eternal damnation. That's the word for hell. Their end is hell. Eternal destruction. Eternal damnation. He says, whose God is their appetite. And the appetite here speaks of a selfish heart, a heart that only wants what it wants poured into it. It doesn't want the things of Christ poured into it. It's a heart that's selfish, literally. Um, a, heart of, uh, a heart that desires to please itself. So they are their own God in their own eyes. They fulfill their own desires. They do what they want. That's what they want. He says they, the glory uh, in, is in their shame. The glory is in their shame. It speaks of a heart of dishonesty, a heart of craftiness, a, a scheming heart that can never build up the body of Christ, only divide it. Because they come in with, they don't have a heart for God's people. They have a heart for their own desires. So, so they bring division in the body of Christ. They can't build it up because they're still looking to please themselves. That's it. And he's saying, watch out for them. Man, their end is destruction. And they set their mind on earthly things. Now, again, he's talking about leaders, overseers of the children of God. So they set their mind, means they constantly entertain earthly opinions. Fond of honor, fond of glory, fond of applause, quick to shame others so they can look good in the eyes of men. That's what that means. They're fond of applause. They're fond of glory. They're fond of honor because they look for it. And they're, and they're quick to put others down so they can be exalted themselves. And he says the end result of their labor literally only brings division and death in the body of Christ for the God they serve is their own heart and their own will and they honor themselves by shaming others because their mind is taken captive by the world. What he's saying is they will end up in everlasting destruction. That's hell. And that's a scary thing because, 
because there are human beings that will spend eternity in hell. And there are many who claim the name Jesus that will go there because their heart is wrong. What's Jeremiah been telling the people? If you've been making it on Wednesday nights, week after week after week after week, he's been telling them, turn. You're, God's telling you, your hearts, you, you love me with your brain, but you don't love me with your heart. Your heart is so far away from me, it's not even funny. It's, been, it's generations away from me. And that's a frightening thing. And he's been trying to tell them over and over and over, and they're at a place where they just can't hear. In verse 20, Paul says, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what he's saying here is, our citizenship, we who walk of the same mind in Christ, we who understand what salvation is, we who understand that I'm being sanctified daily for the rest of my life while I live on this earth, and it'll never end till I go home to be with Him. We who walk that way, we're pilgrims, we're strangers, we're sojourners here on this earth. We shouldn't be looking for the things of the earth to please us because I was looking and longing forward to the time where we can go to the adopted home that we have been given. You and I have been given entrance into heaven for eternity. And he's saying so long after that, let, let the world around you know. Let all those friends that, that try to accomplish worldly desires to appease you just say, listen, that can never satisfy me anymore in my life. Because my fixation now is I've been given a home in heaven where I will spend eternity. Nothing of this earth can ever satisfy me. Do you remember a time where you thought you were fully satisfied by the things of the world? You thought, this is great, man, I'm set. I remember back in the day when I used to drink, and I used to drink a fifth of whiskey a day, fully satisfied. Really? That's insane. My pocketbook wasn't satisfied. My life wasn't. It was miserable. I look back on that now. There was no joy there. What a waste. Those are wasted years. But guess what I learned? That, this, that now I'm satisfied with heaven. I'm satisfied with my Lord. I'm satisfied with where I'm going. I don't have to seek worldly desires. And that's what Paul's saying. We're, we're not to conform to the image of this world, but, but to him who purchased our redemption, that we may live our lives according to this new home that's being prepared for us. We get to heaven. You know what the language of heaven is? Some people say Hebrew. It's Hebrew. It ain't Hebrew. It's love. It's love. And it's an unconditional, unfinged love. It's love. That is the language of heaven. He's poured out to us. We have it now. It's in front of us. Press on towards it. That's what Paul's pressing. Literally, so our, our citizenship or our conversation or our mode of life that sets us apart from this world is from above. It's not from ourselves. It's from heaven and has been set apart for us now by Jesus Christ. So do you think you can get more set apart than what you are now with God? You're already set apart completely for Him. It's learning to walk, putting the losses away and pressing on towards the gains and to say, you know what? I'm going to press on towards this upward call, the prize, the upward call in Christ, fixing my eyes on the finish line because I've been given a race to run and none of us knows when that race is done in our life. Mine could be this afternoon. So I keep my eyes fixed in that finish line and I'm pressing on towards it. And the second mom done on this earth, I will have crossed that line and I'll be in his arms. And he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant, uh, because we press on in that. In verse 21, it's our Lord Jesus Christ who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. So what Paul is saying here is, who can change my natural body, which is defiled with sin, which is frail, which is mortal, which is weak and dishonored, who can transform it to a life filled 
with true hope and true righteousness who can transform it, who can take this natural body and change it into a spiritual body, who can make this transformation happen? And he's saying it's Jesus Christ, literally. He's the only one who can ever make this change in us happen. He is the only one who can give the glory from up above to sinful flesh below, and he is the only one able to, to accomplish this. And, and it is it is his desire to do so in every human heart. That's what Paul's trying to say. God's desire towards you is that you would trust his son so this transformation can take place. And to some people, it happens overnight. And to some people, it takes 20 years. I know when I came to Christ and I realized and he showed me how much he loved me, it changed my life. But there were many things in my life he didn't touch. I learned to wrestle with those things. I learned to say, you know what, I hate this, so see ya, and I'm pressing on towards Christ. And I know I can't do it alone, i got to do it in the midst of God's people where there's strength, where, where I'm strong in Him, where there's power of Him, in, in, in the midst of fellowship, with like-minded people walking through the Word together, praising God together, praying together. You watch these mountains of sin be removed one pebble at a time. And God working, God doing this work in us and through us. So, so Paul's saying, literally, Jesus has done it all in your life. So forgetting the past, which Christ has covered by the accomplished work of the cross, and reaching out towards the goal of fully trusting God's sanctifying work in you, as you speed towards the finish line daily, leaving behind the past and daily pressing on towards what's before you in Christ. You see how important it is that we just press on? One of the greatest Christian words in the New Testament is endure. It's the word let. It means suffer it to be so. It means endure through the suffering. And the suffering is not the persecution. The suffering is laying down your opinion, laying down your thoughts, laying down your feelings, laying down your attitude, and putting on Christ and saying, my Lord would have forgiven this person. My Lord would have looked past this situation and seen that it's going to work out for good and for His glory. My Lord would have, would have tackled this. My Lord would have put this aside. And it's putting on the attitude of Christ. So that's why Paul says it so strongly. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And he's, ex he's encouraging the church to do that. To walk in that way. To walk in that light. And it's very important that we learn to walk that way. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 uh, through 10, you know it well. Paul says to the church in Ephesus, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. And here's the underliner. But God, that's the underliner. This is what we were. We all know it. We remember it. You remember it? Remember that part of life? Like, I don't want that in my life. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. And he has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You already have all you need. All of heaven is at your disposal. So leave behind the things of the past and press on towards the upward call of God, towards the goal in Christ Jesus, verse 7, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. 
so that people might look into my life, people who knew me from before, and they say to me, what gives, man? When did you become religious? <laughs> I didn't. But what, well, I mean, I used to know you before. What's up now? What's with all this mercy and this love and this forgiveness and this grace? What's up with that? What's up with it is that's what was given to me by God when I put my faith and trust in His Son. He washed my past away. He will never hold it against me again. He has poured upon my life a grace and a mercy and a love that's untouchable by anything on this earth. And he's filled me up with it. That's what's up with that. And I press on in that. And, and I'm here to share that with you, to share his love with you. An amazing thing. So a strong chapter, Philippians chapter 3, but a very important one about what it means to leave behind the past and to press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. It requires something on my part. God's done it all in Christ. But it requires me to show forgiveness. It requires me to show mercy. It requires me to show grace. That's the shine of Christ coming out of me towards you. And that's very important. You want to see your past? erased, really, if you, if you still haunted by it, still comes knocking on your door, still tries to invite you out for a drink or a friend or go see something, start showing forgiveness. Start showing mercy. Start showing grace. Let Christ shine out of you. And you'll watch your life change because he is the only one that can bring that transformation to a human heart. Philippians chapter 3, amen? Amen. amen. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you for this time that you've given us to spend in your word. And Lord, I pray that you take your word that was taught today and that you'd plant it deep in every heart that was able to hear it. And I ask, Lord, that you water it by your Holy Spirit, what it might take root and not be stolen away by the enemy, that it might accomplish and, and purpose all that you've set it out to do. Let it continue to reveal our need to trust your Son our need to walk out the responsibilities we've been given in Christ, and, and just to have your way in our midst, Lord. We love you. We just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.